Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm your host, Henry Arslanian, and welcome to this episode of the Future of Money podcast. Before we start, I want to say a big thank you to you, a half a million of you who follow my content each week. This podcast, The Future of Money, is now ranked in the top 5% of all podcasts globally on Spotify. Thank you really from the bottom of my heart. There's thousands of you each week from over 160 countries that are tuning in. So really, really, guys, a big thank you. As all of you loyal listeners know, the goal with my podcast is very simple. It's to go deep in some of the biggest ideas, trends, and developments we are seeing in the field of crypto. And hopefully empower you with this information and then let you make your own decision on what their impact could be on the future of money and finance. This just shows another episode as part of my my new investor series where I'm bringing in not only a lot of allocators, fund managers, but also individuals involved in the broader ecosystem of investing in crypto. And a big topic is due diligence in crypto. And this is why today I'm very honored to have with us James Newman, who's the co-head of Perform Due Diligence Services, uh, to be with us today to talk about the exciting world and the very important world of due diligence in crypto and what to look for when you're trading on a crypto exchange, when you have assets a crypto custodian, or you're looking at allocating in a crypto fund. James, great to have you with us today on the Future of Money podcast. Thank you so much, Henry. It's, uh, I'm delighted to be here and speak to you today. And uh, yeah, who would have known it? Eh? Due diligence is fun and interesting and, and now obviously so important in crypto. I'm sure we'll get into some of that. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Due diligence, I think in a post-FTX, world is the rigor, you know. That's By the way, for other loyal listeners uh, that are listening, uh, you may know James Newman in his capacity as an ODD person, if you want, or due diligence person. But actually, when he's not working on crypto, he's taking helicopter lessons on the weekends. James, I have to say, that's, I always say people in crypto are interesting. I've never had somebody who flies helicopters, so you're a first on that perspective. Thank you. Well, look, it's, I like to, I like to do a couple of firsts and, uh, and this is another one that I'm doing over in the last, the last sort of, sort of few weeks. And, uh, I tell you, James, a very quick story on that. So I went for a lesson yesterday and I spoke, speaking to my pilot and there was a map up on the wall showing the various different, uh, flight paths and sort of, you know, restrictions, uh, for flying in. And I'm asking all these questions and pointing and doing all these different things. And he turns to me, it's the first time he's met me and he turns to me and says, are you from the civil, civil aviation authority? Like, it, what, like all these questions, you like sort of undercover or something. And I kind of like, no, man, I'm not. I promise you, it's just I'm a due diligence analyst. I, I apologize. I'm asking too many questions. But um, hey, let's let's get, get on with it. He's like, he's like, thank, you know, thank goodness for that. <laughs> That's amazing. You see, due diligence skills even go on when you're flying uh, helicopters. Here we go. Who said crypto skills were not, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, transportable to other skills, so other 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 uh, activities? So great to have you with us, James. There's so many things I want to talk with you about today. Uh, before we jump in as well, I just want to make the regular disclosures. Um, Perform due diligence is obviously very active in the broader crypto ecosystem. Uh, so it's possible that actually Perform DD has conducted due diligence on a, a former and current sponsors of the show, including, by the way, businesses that I'm involved in, uh, including my hedge fund and other businesses as well. So I just want to put that disclosure out there uh, to make sure that we have this uh, up front. Um, James, before we jump in, uh, do you mind sharing a bit, a bit about your background, but also what do you do? What is Perform Your Diligence and what services do you guys offer to give some of the listeners context on, on the expertise you guys have? Yeah, I mean, I, I got involved in financial services a good 20, 23 years ago, uh, and that was in traditional alternative investment. So basically, fund the fund route, um, creating and developing an operational due diligence program through the uh, mid 2000s, uh, getting involved a little bit with Madoff and what happened there, and, and uh, managing to miss that bullet and being and, and really elevating that was an interesting time, as you can imagine. Um, but so took some lessons there, one of which was in particular, never just rely on what the name is on the top of the front door as you go in. Right. That, that, that's not that's something you can can rely on these days, as, as it turned out with with Madoff. Um, and then in the sort of second part of those 10 years, I was head of operational due diligence at, uh, at Barclays Wealth. Um, audited by background, uh, general interest, um, Got a nose for being in interest and a nose for seeking out uh, different sort of risks, operational risks that, in other words, that can inhibit someone's ability to make money with an investment. So that's kind of like my my sort of general general interest and theme. Perform Due Diligence Services Limited was launched in 2019. The ORM is Operational Risk Mitigation. So a little play on the word there, but we think that really illustrates what we're trying to do here, mitigate risks. 
And we're a, an award-winning multi-jurisdictional operational due diligence service provider with, uh, I guess, around about 90 plus years now of collective ODD experience. Our clients tend are global. They, you know, they're a diverse group, including investment managers, family offices, private banks, pensions, fund of funds, and, and even sports teams. So really, really an interesting cohort of uh, clients that we work with. And ODD itself provides a risk assessment of corporate, you know, of funds, uh, operations, in, infrastructure, people and trustworthiness. I like to describe it a little bit as, you know, for investors think, you know, do my assets exist? Are they safeguarded from fraud? Are they valued correctly? Is this firm reliable, right? You know, there's a lot of trust that we as investors would put into when handing over our, 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 our dollar tickets. And this helps clients avoid losses and avoid, you know, being associated with bad actors. And for stakeholders, you know, not just investors, but stakeholders as well. So, could be you're transacting with a, an exchange or a custodian, you know, think how, you know, think how reputable is our counterparty or is the counterparty? Uh, how do they compare, compare to their cohort? What could key controls are lacking that could increase, increase my risk of being financially or reputationally hurt? And then finally, our services that we provide, uh, we wrap them up into sort of working directly for investors. So what we call allocator on demand, ODD, no subscriptions, Use us once, use us many times, absolutely good with us. Then we have investment manager therapy. So we're helping the investment managers prepare for operational due diligence visits. And we extend that to actually performing operational due diligence reports for them. And then we do service provider due diligence as well. So, you know, everywhere from your standard alternative fund administrator in the TradFi space, all the way through to exchanges, custodians in the, in the crypto space. And last but not least, enhanced background checks. So we do a lot of, we can sell that alternatively and independently, separate to all the other stuff. And we think that that's a really interesting aspect as we enhance the background checks that we're doing, which is a very, very important part of an operational due diligence review. I definitely want to have some questions on that as well, on the background checks. Before, before I go into background checks though, I mean, can you maybe explain for our audience, how is ODD, operational due diligence, different in digital assets versus uh, ODD when it comes to traditional finance? Do you know what, Henry? There are, there are many uh, parallels to, to both. Um, uh, you know, my opening statement there are, do my assets exist? Is the financial, is the firm reliable? Do you understand and have transparency of how the, the, um, the pipe work within the business works? But, and there's a big but here, crypto, of course, is a very nascent asset class. And there are some real novel risks associated with crypto and how crypto is held, how it's transferred and, and, and how it can be, uh, uh, effect, how can it be, um, uh, compromised, right? And then it's a, that's a very different, different set of risks compared to, um, traditional finance. And often the firms in crypto are lightly regulated. You know, the regulatory environment itself is nascent. You know, it's not, it can be a little ambiguous, right? You know, that you, you know, it's, it's quite hard for firms to navigate themselves through that and demonstrate institutional standards in crypto. Um, and, then, and then, of course, from an investor perspective, you're not benefiting from the regulatory protections necessarily that you get in the traditional finance. And so the need to do your own research is even stronger. And that's why, you know, we've been so prominent and dominant within the, within the crypto space. Yeah, I would also argue in many regards, right, even if you had some regulatory protection that we, we think we have, I think we've seen over and over, both in crypto and also both in TradFi, it doesn't mean much. I think that there's, a, there's a need to, to doing some enhanced due diligence work on some of these counterparties, right? Yeah, and if I could pick you up on that point, I think there's a real, there is a, there's an underlying theme there that um, although regulation itself will not protect you, right, we know in traditional finance, fraud occurs, bad actors occur, errors occurs. You know, there tends to be an emphasis on fraud and, and bad actors, but it's errors as well, right, that, that can hurt people. So it, it, they're just genuine errors that, that get occur. Now, within a regulatory environment, both the recruitment of people, uh, their interest in across the firm, back office, middle office, as well as the front office, is geared in, right, to their psyche. It's already there. Yeah. So you're coming to the party with, um, we call it institutional mindset, right? And we can get into a little bit that what that really means. But in other words, you're, you're stepping into this, this environment, not just as a trader, not just somebody who's not thinking about that side of things, but someone who is. And where we've seen a lot of lack of that, we think, is, is where they're unprepared. There's the retail, there's the institutional part. 
So there's having that regulatory piece kind of like reaffirms and get, gets people into the right main, uh, mindset. Without that, you're going to do it on your own. You know, on that point of, you mentioned obviously the, re- the institutional mindset. Mm. Uh, how do you think the industry has changed post FTX? Are you seeing more of an institutional mindset come into play or you believe it just is just temporary and it's going to fade away and some of the bad habits will come up again? Yeah, I think, uh, I think from an institutional investor perspective, there obviously has been a step back post FTX and there's some, there has been, we've seen de-risking that's been going on into the end of 2022. Um, you've seen that increased regulatory scrutiny. If you see, obviously it's, it's, it's there every day, right? When you read about it and what's going on, and there's some really high profile, um, investigations that are ongoing at, at the moment and turn, effectively turning those screws. But I think the, um, we a- anecdotally from the, you know, uh, many reviews that we're doing in the exchanges and custodians and crypto firms themselves, you know, it would be a massive missed opportunity if this is not a wake up call, if this is not something that, so, you know, the actively, for, I'll give you one example, right? Compliance and regulation and, and the internal controls involved of that. Is, do, are we seeing demonstrable improvements in that area whenever we're doing our, our, our due diligence? And if it's not, right? So everyone needs to improve, in my view. Everyone needs to step. No one's, no one's immune from this. So we're actively looking for where those improvements are being made and, and how that's being communicated and translated to it for us. Interesting. So actually, let's, I want to I go deep, go more a level deeper in some of these things that you mentioned. Let's start actually with background checks. I think uh, for a lot of traditional regulated, regulated financial institutions, uh, background checks are very common. When you mention enhanced background checks, what do you think are some of the uh, enhanced or different uh, areas of focus that when you're doing background checks on people in crypto uh, that are different than when you're doing it for people working in traditional finance or in other industries? I think, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of commonality in you know, a background check is a back, is a background check, right? It's, it's, it's obviously, it's, it's reviewing and ensuring that there's integrity in what that, where that, what that person was doing, where they come from, but more importantly, what they're connected with. So I think they're, you know, rightly or wrongly, it, it's a, I think it's a perception that there's, that you're at more at risk in the crypto space of potentially having a, a negative uh, 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 flag come up from a background check, right? I, 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 I can't in any way comment or no, I have no basis to say any of that, but I think it's fair to say there's a little bit of that. So there's a whole variety of people in the space, right? Some of traditional finance backgrounds, all those guys and girls would have been through many background checks at these institutional firms. Many people haven't, and that's not a problem in itself, but, it's, but I think it is necessary to do those level of background checks. Now, background checks are simply... You know, there are many firms out there that provide those services. We use one of which, um, but we enhance that by using our own internal expertise, uh, which is able to use some of the um, our experience over the years in performing background checks and using different sources to do that. There's a little bit of, um, you know, it's just as important to find maybe uh, a potential smoking gun, but it's easily, it's so easy to mistake that wrongly. You know, you would have heard of false positives, right? So a lot of these, a lot of these firms, they provide and they help to strip those out. But we we enhance that by using our own internal uh, expert to be able to do that. So that's what we mean by it's still relatively affordable. It's not re- it's not that expensive, but we think we offer that as a separate uh, separate service. I mean, I would argue on that. You know, in many regards, like let's say look at FTX. I'm sure if we did a background check on SBF, it would have all come clean, right? So I think for some of these founders, uh, the, the, because of the lack of history. I'm not sure how uh, relevant it could be, but also I agree with you that in many regards, the traditional background check approach is completely outdated. I mean, uh, recently I was talking to somebody who's, uh, who's 50 years old. He's been a regulated portfolio manager all his career, and he's moving to a new country, and they're asking for a certified true copy of his university diploma. I mean, this was 30, 40 years ago, right? I mean, 30 years ago. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, I think there's, there's different things we have to improve on that process as well. Yeah, and if you think of due diligence as well, and you incorporate background checks in in that, it's it's not necessarily uh, one big smoking gun, right? It's not like one. You're not going to do this due diligence, and they, there you go. There's the fraud, right? Or there's the potential for fraud. You're looking for signs and indicators that could lead to what we call an environment that can help. It's a weird way of saying it, but can help foster 
uh, bad, or going back to my point earlier, errors, right? Um, so those are really important things. And if you put those things, you put, you can combine that with our 90 plus years of experience, we're able to, um, we're able to maneuver ourselves and actually navigate our clients through that interpretation, through that data to be able to come up with a, an opinion. I mean, you mentioned the errors, right? So, of course, when we think about due diligence, we think of these big smoking guns, as you mentioned. When it comes to errors, and I would presume it's operational uh, viability in a way, right, or rigor on, on the operational side, what have you seen from your experience? Like, how concerned should people in crypto be or how often are these errors taking place and how material are they? Yeah, I think the, the errors are born out of two things, really. That is the, the robustness and, and uh, suitability of the internal controls uh, mapped to services, either proprietary or using of the third party to be able to implement certain checks and balances. So, you know, if you're, we mentioned, we mentioned a little bit about the regulatory environment and about a, literally, you need to be able to see a compliance li- uplift now. You need to be actually see whether you're an exchange or a custodian or a fund manager that needs to lift up. Now that's not that that in effect helps nullify and mitigate the risk of errors. Errors could be a misjudgment. It could be a system um, failure. It could be a lack of redundancy. It could be having in, having your your operational and, and um, technology environment um, at risk of in some in some form of infringement. Now, the biggest one, of course, is asset security and counterparty risk and looking for the appropriate controls and checks uh, in place to enable the errors or misjudgments or just, you know, going back to the point of opportunity for fraud are not present as much as is possible. You know, no, you'll know this better than anyone, right? And as I do, this, this is not risk free, right? No one in due, in due diligence is trying to mitigate risk entirely. But what you can do is you can identify those, you can observe what the mitigants are, and then importantly, you can advise and mitigate and, and minimize those. Um, that's really the key to it. And, and ultimately, every investor wants to just rely on investment risk, not operational risk. That's a zero sum game. You get no premium out of it. In fact, uh, many people argue about operational alpha, another term that's been bounded around for years in my, that I've been working in. In actual fact, you can increase returns if you have good controls, you have, you know, uh, you have staff, you have that are content, that are satisfied, that are treated well, diversity and inclusion. All of these things that in themselves are important, but bring together what is what would be called an institutional framework and, and firm to be able to uh, oversee and manage your money. Of course. So let's go. Let's go a bit. A bit. Let's go talk about some of the various members of the crypto ecosystem. Let's talk about exchanges, for example. When you're doing due diligence on a crypto exchange, or let's say one of our listeners is an institutional investor and they're looking at trading on one of the crypto exchanges, what are some of the two or three major elements you believe should be looked at that are often overlooked when it comes to some of these institutional investors and crypto exchanges? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's, uh, that's kind of a podcast in itself, really, sort of, right? It, it's a big, you know, we spend up to two to three months doing due diligence on exchanges. You know, we've, we've, uh, we've now looked at in, in excess of 12 uh, entities across the, across the piece. Um, we generally observe, uh, we, I mentioned about the compliance uplift. So policies and controls, particularly around in, um, AML and KYC and trade surveillance. Those are really important ones, um, but we see that tend to tend to see there are risks involved where there are complex multi-jurisdictional footprints, you know, opaque and complex offshore structures. Um, and we would see we observe, for example, high customer balances in hot wallets uh, would be typically more prone to hacking. Uh, we look for indicators of poor surveillance and controls around market ma- manipulation. Um, we would also look for, you know, the, uh, around um, how the exchanges um, maybe uh, have episodes of running high levels of key person risk or fraud risk by having like a single private key holder. So, things, things like that. And it, and it would be un, it would be wrong of me not to mention particularly the risk management environment. Right. We talked about how important maybe reg, like if regulation was in place prior to FTX, how would that have changed things? I think we can all agree that's not the silver bullet here. 
But I think what we could agree, I believe, is that the risk management functions. So whether they're poorly described, that's one thing. Transparency has not been typically very high and that needs to improve. You know, if you're good at risk management, you should shout about it. You should be proud of it and make that clear. So if you're not talking about it, well, maybe you don't have good risk management standards. You know, even if there is simply a chief risk officer involved um, and just merely pointing to segregated insurance funds uh, is not, in our view, best practice in that in that in that uh, in that area. What is uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, a lot of these crypto exchanges. I mean, if you had to put a grade on these crypto exchanges overall from one to 10, 10 being perfection and one being you know, terrible, terrible failure. Where do you think the industry is right now, uh, uh, you know, post FTX, a couple of months after FTX now? Uh, I'd say whatever I, I, I would say it's up by two points. Right. If you want to score your one to 10, what it has done, I think, is improved, is drawn attention to everyone who needs to up ha, and is upping their game. We, we've, we've demonstrably seen we started looking at exchanges and custodians, what, nearly 18 months ago. And that that was, you know, it was pretty tough. Right. And it and it and we're deep dive. Right. So we, we make no excuses for it. We <laughs> we do a lot of work on that. And I think that was quite a bit of a shock to the system to many. Um, but I think now we're seeing a measurable improvement over the last um, six to nine months in that regard. But there's a journey there to be had. You know, you go back to hedge funds, right, in the early 2000s, right, and and where there are service providers that are not well known, right? Minimum operational track record, firms that are not necessarily working in the regulatory environment. So what crypto has achieved and running in with institutional um, um uh, uh, sort of ex- um, working with institutions is something that has accelerated massively over the last two years. And people are very easily forget there was no difference there as it was with hedge funds. There were frauds, there were issues going on there, and there was a lack of institutional um, focus on the envir- on that environment. And many of my peers in the industry will, you, will, will talk exactly about that. You know, we, we've done, I used to do in my days trips down to um, the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority, right? You know, obviously a nice place to go. We were going down there and we were literally lobby, lobbying for improved standards. Um, it's very easy to forget that that was in a pretty, pretty prior dire state at the time, back in the 06 and 07. Whilst everyone's making money, of course, no one tends to look at it too much. Crypto has had its moment and we really hope that that will be, therefore, uh, the, the turning point. We'll look back at FTX, we'll look back at late 2022 and point and say that was the point where it happened. Um, and the research and due diligence that needed to prepare these firms is more important than ever. And that's why we offer services to both service, service providers like exchanges and custodians, as well as to investment managers to get institutional ready. Um, so that you don't you don't you don't uh, miss those opportunities to improve sentiment transactions and working with those firms. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I totally agree with you on this one, James. Where you know people like you said in the crypto hedge in the hedge fund space, they forget about LTCM and all the other right. blow ups that happened over the years. And it's really the same evolutionary path the crypto industry will go through, probably even faster because there's a there's a the, you know the, we know what it what great looks like in many regards, right? Uh, so it's interesting on, on that perspective. I want to continue on the topic. So you mentioned crypto exchanges. Let's say when we when an investor is looking at a crypto custodian, is there anything different or anything in addition they should look at from a due diligence perspective compared to other, uh, let's say, parts of the ecosystem, including uh, exchanges, for example? Or let me put it another way, when somebody is about to choose a crypto custodian, what are some of the essential things they need to look for that are often overlooked? I think what we, um, it d- depends a little bit on the role of the custodian and without getting too much into the arena of uh, self-custody technology-based custodian firms and then the actual what perceived custodians are looking to hold uh, crypto assets. Um, so there are differences ar- ar- around that. So depending what you're looking to buy, depends what you're looking to use the custodian for. Um, you know, I think that there we see from an operational standpoint similar weaknesses or call them challenges that you would see for 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 exchanges but i think there are definitely efforts whereby there's more focus on uh legal safeguards right with with custodians so so there's the aspiration to be able to safeguard 
uh, assets, to segregate assets. And you, the, 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 we can, another time we can talk about how those different models look and how well and how we think they apply in different circumstances. But, you know, ensuring that there's the safeguard around some of the structures that are being performed. That could be a trust structure whereby you have the custodian as the trustee, you have the beneficiary of the custodian and the exchange and the client as beneficiaries that is uh, that is um, reinforced by legal safeguards. I think that's one that um, it needs to be a, more of a focus in on, as well as the standards of ensuring that the assets that the custodian is holding are demonstrably segregated from their own assets and imposition, ensuring there's no imposition of rights of lien on offset or encumbrance or, or, or any way. Just one thing, of course, on the um, looking at the some some exchanges and also some of the custodians as well are are providing these sort of statement of, uh, statement of reserves, and there is the potential for overstatement of reserves. You know, if customer A has deposits of 10 BTC and has a uh, 10 BTC balance, while customer B has a negative balance of 5 BTC, the 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 counterparty may appear solvent if it reports to some uh, the total custom balances of 5 BTC against the net 5 BTC. So therefore, those the assets actually being held is not in fact insolvent if customer A tries to withdraw their 10 BTC. So there's some there's some issues there's some issues around that. And then also just finally on the audit versus approved upon procedures, AUPs are not audits. They're good. They're, they're absolutely, you know, when we do our ODD, we look at SOX, we look at AUPs, we look at ISOs, we look at all those different things. They're really, really important. But make sure you know or you're using someone who can tell you the difference between an audit and an AUP. Um, you know, AUPs exclude, for example, the accuracy of the numbers. Nor the nor the integrity of the firm's controlled environment, and whereas an audit would do that. So some key differences there, um, and I would see custodians particularly now should be showing more sort of uh, evidence of the three lines of defence. So you have a defence at the at the functional level, you have defences at the at the at the compliance level, whether you're regulated or not, but also you have some internal audit as well that's overseeing those those two activities. Um, they're, they're key parts, I think, to what we should see custodians as they evolve and become institution, more institutional themselves. And that's separate to their models and the pros and cons of the way, different ways that they're holding assets or, or, or safeguarding those. No, absolutely. I think we can have a whole episode on the agreed, you know, first to whatever our audience, AUP means yeah. agreed upon procedures, yeah, absolutely. which are something a lot of the big accounting, consulting firms will offer. It's interesting also, you mentioned the three lines of defense, which uh, for anybody who works, works in traditional finance, that's also how a lot of these banks will look at their uh, different the layers of protection, right? The, the first, second and third layer. So like, the model is there, like what what great looks like is actually in place, right? And actually, I want to just dive, uh, just focus on one aspect you mentioned, which is the proof of reserves. There's been a lot of talk in the media recently and also a lot of uh, announcements on behalf of crypto firms that they're now trying to be more transparent. And one way of doing that is via proof of reserves. You mentioned, obviously, right now that what is provided in the case of proof of reserves may not uh, provide the full description, of course, because we don't know the liability. We don't know the other side of that, ba that balance sheet, if you want, right. on that side. How comfortable are you with proof of reserves that exchanges are providing right now? Do you think it's a positive first step or you think it can be misleading? I think it shouldn't be overstated. And I don't mean the pun in relation to uh, reserves, right? Literally, it shouldn't be the value that should be applied to those can, cannot be over overstated. I think, you know, the, you, there are... Um, you know, there are firms out there that were being pushed for many, many a year to be able to open up their how how their assets are being backed and, and where those assets are being used. You know, those proof of well, let's say I don't think they're I don't see the proof of reserve, basically. Right. It's a statement of reserves or a statement of a collection of balances, which may not include negative balances. So all you know, it, there's no uh, there's no there's no second agenda here. It's simply that I think that any statement of any assets and liabilities, and talking here as an auditor, it should be very clear what is in and what's not in. And if it's not in, then just state it's not in for whatever reason, and just be clear on what that is. Otherwise, you kind of get into this kind of like you know uh, sort of uh, comedy of saying you know, which we'll see on Twitter and other other uh, on Telegram and all the rest of it. 
of what may or may not be actually being included. And that can give it, a, uh, unfortunately, can give a negative slant to what actually what the firm is doing something to be able to give confidence to uh, depositors, uh, other interested stakeholders. Um, so, yeah, it could go it could go further. Um, I mean, audit itself, we, we talk about uh, proof of reserves, or as I call a statement, or I like to call it a statement of reserves. What about just an audit? Yeah, do a, do an audit, right? And that that would really be the the thing that should be necessary. And for these, well, ultimately, what these firms can be or are, where they're not regulated, they're private firms that don't need to have an audit. Uh, that that would be a that would be something I would like to see in the next twelve months. More audits. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned the statement of reserve compared to proof of reserve. I like the term. But actually, you know, uh, James, like if we look at the crypto ecosystem today, and I know I speak to many CEOs of crypto companies, uh, many people who are generally trying to do the right thing, right? What's your advice on what they, what they should do to demonstrate that they are institutional and they have in place the right policies, procedures, uh, and that they are doing the right thing versus, for example, like you said, just showing a proof of reserve, which does not necessarily give the right, the full picture of the business. I, I think they should go on the front foot with a lot of this. You know, um, don't wait for necessarily a performed due diligence services analyst to turn up and ask or, okay, you know, show us, show us your DD, show us your due diligence questionnaire, which will go through your, uh, what we call operational pillars all the way from in, in infrastructure, technology, uh, the way customer assets are held and so on. Go on the front foot, right? Demonstrate it. So when you get an inquiry, have at least a minimum of, of a, a due diligence pack that will demonstrate that one, you're thinking about the right things and your, uh, your motive is right. Because what you're doing is you're saying, look, we're an institution. We know what institutions want to see. Here is our pack. This will give you 80, 85% of what you need to know. And for the majority of inquiries, that might actually be enough, right? So it's, it's hard work, you know. Let, let's not let's not put this. Uh, let's not deny. It. You know, you mentioned they're doing. They want to do the right thing, right? And it's hard work, and they need the people to be able to do all this as well. And they, it's not an easy job, but that's not a reason not to do this or develop some form of pack or program. Obviously, our work in the expert in the space, as we we're very keen in the space, is to educate and inform. When we do do when we do due diligence, it's not like uh you know you know sort of sounding out or finding someone and saying hey you know the UN got this in place and so we'll see you next year and we'll come back and you know we we're active ourselves we're transparent we inform firms even if they're not in our own clients but we know when we're working with them about what they need to put in place and what they need to improve so um i like it i like the fact that they as i say post ftx in particular but even before then these changes were happening you know, it's definitely a positive move forward, um, but it will take time, obviously, to bring that level of institutional interest back. Yeah. James, we're out of time. There, one last question I want to ask you before we go to our far round of uh, questions. Like, what is the crazy story you've seen so far? I mean, you've done due diligence on numerous custodians, exchanges, funds. Like, what is one of the craziest stories you can share with our audience of like a massive well, DD <laughs> failure that you've seen without naming names, of course? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. Um, well, obviously, this is benefit of hindsight, of course, but, you know, one fund had 100% of its client assets on FTX, right? So now you could say, yeah, but well, no, well, you, you know, obviously post FTX, you know, benefit of hindsight, but that old classic in traditional finance of, of spreading your risk, diversification of risk with your counterparties and brokers and prime brokers, right, applies here. So be smart about that. Don't, don't necessarily uh, uh, think of not doing that. I think the, the challenge, of course, uh, back coming from that is, well, okay, it's, it's quite a slim, relatively slim cohort of providers or counterparties to work with. But, you know, then nonetheless, it's something that needs to be, um, considered. I think some of the other sort of crazy things we've seen is just simply the, and it, and it, and it may be in a, it's probably, it is innocent, right? In terms of you know, these firms are coming in, founders, CIOs and so on, setting up these businesses. But they're able to have 100% responsible and um, permission and authorization to move cash and crypto assets, right? Which in traditional finance is a bit crazy, right? To have that in place without any counterbalances and counterchecks. No one's suspecting of any wrongdoing, but you, you, it's not an institutional way of setting yourself um, out, uh, uh, setting yourself out. And then sometimes when we do see like compliance and regulatory 
thresholds and controls coming in place. They can be a little bit crazy, like, for example, a personal account dealing policy that had a uh, that a threshold where it be reportable or or seek permission for a personal account trading only when it hit four hundred thousand dollars, right? You know, needs to be a little bit lower than that, right? To to be really of any of any use. So any anything that we see where the controls are have something in name um, but are not actually going to be have any bite to them is is a little bit is a little bit crazy. Um, but you know, it's it's like I said, it's a nascent asset class. There's a lot of new people coming into this. I think the vast majority are trying to do the right thing. They want to learn how to do things that will attract institutional money. And we at Perform here, that's exactly what we're doing. We're providing that that bridge between one and the other um, to improve activity and safety within the space. Love it, uh, James. Thank you very much for being on the on the show, James. Now Atlanta, my favorite bell is here. There are ODD due diligence person, so they're gonna keep us honest. I need I need one or two word quick answers, James, on, on my questions, and we're gonna take it from there. Are you ready? Go for it. Let's do it. James, you mentioned you you you're taking helicopter lessons. What's the one thing that excites you about helicopters? Uh floating in floating in the air. What is one movie or helicopter movie that you really like that you recommend? Um, it will be me flying a helicopter in two years' time. <laughs> this, is a, this is a good one. If you could on. hire one superhero as your analyst to do due diligence on crypto companies, which superhero would you pick? Iron Man. He needs to be tough. A young student comes to you and says they want to they want to go into ODD uh, due diligence. Uh, what topic do you think they should study in university? Uh, law and or uh, accountancy. I agree. Good answer is. Uh, what's one. exciting you about the future of crypto? Uh, I uh, I think the opportunity to be able to to expand and give access to institutions in in a way that hasn't been there before. Love it. If you had to do a due diligence on Satoshi Nakamoto, what questions would you ask him or her or they? How, how, are you going to, how are you going to ensure that the technology that you have developed can be used within uh, financial services other than just for crypto? So improving middle and back office um, processes, reducing costs, uh, improving transaction activity. Interesting. I love it. If the what 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 one piece of advice you would give to any crypto entrepreneur? If there's one thing they can improve that is essential when it comes to due diligence, what would that be? Uh, other than using us, <coughs> I would say that uh, bring in a COO or CFO to help you set up the firm. Yeah, exactly. It's a very common mistake I see across the industry. Well said, James Newman. If you're not in crypto doing due diligence, what other industry would you be in? Uh, I would be. I would. Be in cycling or uh, helicopters. <laughs> that be the two my, oh my yeah, that would be my thing. Yeah, my yeah, God. yeah. I love it. Love cycling. Love getting out there in the air. Yeah. When do you think you'll do it in the Tour de France? Are we going to see you there one day? Well, are you going to join me? Can I? Can I convince you? So well, I'm going to spinning to lesson tomorrow morning at eight thirty. <laughs> so at least uh, there you go. That's a start. <laughs> There you go. And, and James, to finish it off, the the, uh, the classic question at the Future of Money podcast. Uh, James, if you, could have, if you could have lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, who do you have lunch with? Uh, I would have lunch with Gordon Gecko. Wow. Why is that? Uh, I'd like to know what he thinks about um, the the state of the investing and state of due diligence uh, now. So a little bit geeky, but I'd like his response to it. I think he's a changed man. He'd be a changed man. Let's hope so. That was James Newman, the co-head of Perfo- Perf- uh, the co-head of Perform Due Diligence Services. James it was great having you with us. How can people find out more about you and the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, we, we obviously you can find us online. You can, we've got at uh, www.performedudentservices. You'll find us on there. Uh, we just recently re- refreshed and renewed our uh, website. So there's more, more information available there. Obviously on LinkedIn, you can find me there. Um, I'm around. Um, so please do drop me a line and I'll always respond without exception. 
Awesome, James. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Future of Money podcast. A good reminder also to check out my YouTube page uh, at Henry R. Slayan. As usual, we have a lot of exclusive content in multiple languages as well. So, guys, uh, feel free to check the, the YouTube page. And again, if you like this episode, make sure to actually like us, uh, give us a five star rating. Uh, that really helps more people discover the show. Thank you very much, everybody, and hope you enjoy this other episode of the Future of Money podcast and this special investor series. And see you all next time. Thank you, guys, and see you all next time.